coalition of pro-democracy reformers want Hong Kong's next chief executive to be directly elected in 2017. The Chinese government says the leader must be chosen from a nominated list. Last year, as this increasingly heated debate brought thousands onto the streets, People and Power was behind the scenes with activists seeking to galvanize public opinion. The last of three special reports explains how their hopes were dashed as the authorities refused to make concessions and the police closed in. October the 1st, 2014, the 65th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. For some in Hong Kong, it was a time to celebrate. For others, a chance to take a stand. As the Chinese flag went up, Joshua Wong, an activist from his student group Scholarism, responded. It was a small gesture that spoke volumes. An act of defiance in the midst of the biggest show of defiance Beijing had seen since Tiananmen. Wong lit the fuse on September the 26th when he urged fellow activists to storm an area outside government headquarters. The move capped a week-long student strike called to protest Beijing's proposal for universal suffrage in Hong Kong. China wanted to vet candidates for the city's top job. Activists said this wasn't democracy. Police arrested Wong shortly after the storming but thousands of supporters dug in their heels. And on September the 28th, as the crowd spilled onto surrounding roads, police responded with tear gas. The move backfired. Each canister that went off seemed to attract even more angry protesters. Eighty-seven rounds later, demonstrators had occupied roads in three different parts of Hong Kong. It was the start of what the world would come to know as the Umbrella Movement. But how would it all end? The early days of the occupation were hopeful ones. As police retreated, protesters took control of the streets. They shared food and drink. They made art. And they cleaned up after themselves. But for the activists who first championed the idea of a civil disobedience movement in Hong Kong, the situation presented a dilemma. How can this uh, demonstration last for days or even weeks? It's a big question. And we are also worried that some people may be sent into among them to create troubles. The Occupy Central team had spent months drawing up careful plans for an illegal sit-in in just one area of the business district. Civil disobedience was their response to what they saw as Beijing's failure to grant Hong Kong fully democratic elections. They vowed to cause minimal disruption to the general public. But events overtook them. Now there were three different occupied sites filled with people who wouldn't necessarily listen to them.
In the early hours of October the 2nd, student leaders called on supporters to surround chief executive CY Leung's offices. The students demanded dialogue with CY Leung. But the chief executive hadn't responded to earlier requests for talks. Would it be different this time round? The next day, a large group of police tried to push their way into Lung's office compound. They explained they were merely changing shift, and protesters let them through. By evening, the crowd outside Leung's office had grown, demanding an explanation for what had happened earlier in the day. A few protesters threatened to occupy the road behind. At 11.30, the chief executive held a press conference. And I'm now appointing the uh, Chief Secretary to represent Hong Kong government to meet with, with the representatives of the Hong Kong Federation students to discuss uh, constitutional development. Volunteers directed traffic and linked arms, holding back those still hoping to take the road. They managed to keep the peace, but Long War Road would remain a flashpoint throughout the occupation. <laughs> Opponents of the movement soon made their presence felt. They attacked protesters in the working class neighborhood of Mong Kok on the 3rd of October. Later the same day, chaos in Causeway Bay as masked men pushed down barriers set up by the protesters and assaulted them. As police arrived, the crowd called on them to arrest the masked men. But after a short discussion with police, the group were allowed to leave. Now, by the second week of the occupation, the crowd had thinned considerably. But at the main protest site in Admiralty, key highways continued to be barricaded. No one can command the movement. We need to spend a lot of time negotiating with uh, student young people who manage those barricades. A representative from Occupy Central visited the barricades one afternoon. Because we have already received quite a lot of complaints from like taxi drivers and some, uh, I mean, elementary school principal saying that we have been causing nuisance to the um, neighborhood. So if we are, well, we think that um, if our target is the government, then we shouldn't cause too much inconvenience to the neighborhood. Hey, 
，我唔會受命於任何人。我哋實呢度。十一日之前咯，即係廿八號開始。廿八號咯，差唔多啦。你哋有冇一啲政治訴求㗎？即係呢啲真係達到啦，你哋先會放棄佔領啊！嗱，一樣嘢，如果你要快快手手即刻叫我哋走嘅話，一樣嘢好簡單，兩張已經落台，你即刻走。嗯。即刻翻屋企。即刻翻屋企。你人車走啊！俾車走。你人車。October the fifteenth. A standoff on Long War Road. Protesters had tried to occupy this tunnel earlier in the evening. Police sent to clear them soon found themselves surrounded on both sides. The crowd cheered as police left. But it was just the start of what would be a very long night. Several hours later, the police were back. They arrested 45 people that night. Among them, activist and social worker Ken Zhang. Seven police officers took him away. And then, in a dark corner, they did this. I'm standing near by the side of the tunnel. And then I just grabbed by the, some policemen suddenly. And then they just start to hit me, kick me, kneading me at the, at the first place. And then they dropped me, uh, dragged me all the way to that famous dark corner. And then they beat me for more than four minutes. After this footage was widely circulated, the seven officers were suspended from active duty pending an investigation. October the 17th. Thousands filled the streets of Mong Kok after police cleared most of the occupied site earlier that day. The protesters spilled into side streets and onto roads still open to traffic. Police struggled to contain the crowd. To keep them on the pavement, hundreds of officers had to stand on the road. At traffic junctions, protesters found novel ways to keep police busy. With police spread out all over Mong Kok, a group of protesters moved in on the area's main thoroughfare. Police attempted to disperse the crowd, but they were severely outnumbered. Police retreated and the celebrations began. Protesters now occupied an even larger area than before. 各位學聯嘅同學，我先問啲介紹我哋今日出席嘅同事。October the 21st. After several delays, government officials and representatives from the Hong Kong Federation of Students were finally meeting. At the Admiralty protest site, a large crowd gathered to watch a live broadcast. Throughout the meeting, Chief Secretary Kerry Lam insisted that Beijing's offer was a step forward. The students disagreed.
Despite the applause, there would be no major breakthrough. The government offered to submit a report to Beijing, but made no other promises. Mid-November, a group carrying yellow umbrellas gathered at Hong Kong's international airport. They were met by a smaller group with banners condemning the Federation of Students. More than three weeks had passed since the students' meeting with government officials. They were now hoping to take their case to Beijing. This is a protest to well, the attitude uh, of Beijing towards Hong Kong people. Uh, of course, we would say, well, uh, dialogue is important uh, for well, resolving the current dispute. But it depends on whether Beijing has the initiative uh, to uh, 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 open dialogue uh, with students. But the students weren't able to board their plane. They were told authorities had cancelled their travel permits to mainland China. As the protests wore on, with no real response from the government, cracks started appearing in the movement. On November the 18th, rumours circulated that the Legislative Council was planning to pass a controversial internet bill. It wasn't true, but some protesters decided to act. In the early hours of the morning, they even tried to break into the Legislative Council. Police brought the situation under control, but the damage was done. Police strongly condemned the violent acts of some radical protesters. The rioters' acts have seriously disrupted public order and public safety and led to damage in various parts of the electrical complex. <laughs> November the 25th. A small stretch of the protest site in Mong Kok had just been cleared by police and bailiffs enforcing an injunction brought by a bus company. Now demonstrators filled the roads nearby. Police swept through the streets, spraying liquid tear gas on anyone in their way. The umbrellas went up. But this would be the last night of the Mong Kok occupation. Police had earlier announced that they would help enforce another injunction the following day, this time with the aim of clearing the entire site. The next morning, Joshua Wong and his fellow activists were in Mong Kok to support the protesters. They also had questions for the bailiffs. A group of men wearing red caps had been called in to help. The activists wanted to know who they were. The red hats left soon after and police took over. They isolated the activists. And then... They grabbed Wong. Come On the 64th day of the occupation, student leaders decided to take a risk. The government hadn't offered them a single concession. The Mong Kok site was gone and the movement was losing momentum. The plan was simple. Once again, they were going to try to encircle government headquarters and taking Lung Wo Road would be key. Across the road, a large crowd broke through the police cordon, bringing traffic to a standstill.
Police pushed back with batons and pepper spray. As they broke, they drove occupiers off the road and back into the main protest site. 40 people were arrested. Many more were hurt. Emotions ran high when it became clear the operation had failed. The founders of Occupy Central were turning themselves in. They had played an increasingly smaller role in the movement. But with more protesters getting hurt, they hoped the students would listen to their plea. I hope that they can uh, wisely stop the occupation or at least um, reduce the scale of occupation just to create a kind of balance uh, so that they can you know, gain support from the communities when they have already faced such kind of backlash from the communities. Despite the fall in public support, the students didn't withdraw. But when the government didn't respond to a hunger strike called by Wong, they knew the end was near. The chief executive had already made his position clear. <laughs> On the 10th of December, thousands of protesters filled the site for the very last time. The next day, as police sealed off the area and dismantled the site, a group of protesters sat down on the road. Other occupiers may have left, but they wanted to be arrested. The future belongs to these young people. We should listen to them. But I am quite pessimistic that in the coming few years, that we will have a substantial change in our political system. Without uh, the determination of top leaders in Beijing to have social and political reform in China, it will be very difficult for Hong Kong to have full democracy. It took police hours to arrest everyone. Chow was among the last to be taken away. Inside the bus, protesters raised their hands in a three-finger salute, defined to the very end. Police have summoned the founders of Occupy Central, student leaders and other activists for questioning. To date, formal charges have yet to be brought against them. <laughs>